Welcome to York Minster on a day that the church remembers the social reformers Samuel and Henrietta Barnett, who worked for religious and cultural improvement in the East End of London during the early part of the 20th century. As we think of them this day, we pause to think of all who have worked to reform unjust structures within our society. I am joined remotely by Gavin Wakefield, who leads the training team for York Diocese and has recently written a book on pilgrimage, within which he picks up and focuses on Yorkshire's famous reformers, William Wilberforce, Richard Osler and Joseph Rowntree. Our contribution this evening is quite timely in the current circumstances of Black Lives Matter. And Gavin's reflection on the past is a reminder that in order for change to take place, people do need to stand up and be counted and allow their voices to be heard. He also reminds us that the commitment to social reform is a long-term commitment and change may begin with a revolution or an inspiring figure or indeed by, as we've seen in recent weeks, by the brutal murder of an individual. But permanent reform has to be worked at and is a collaborative effort and commitment. For Christians, our inspiration and commitment comes foremost through the life and teaching of Jesus, who in a long tradition of prophets before him, joined the cry of Moses, let my people go. So we hear a reading from the Gospel according to Luke. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Hello, my name is Gavin Wakefield and I lead the training team in the Diocese of York, supporting the learning for and formation for lay people and clergy. Over the past few years, I've been exploring the Christian history of Yorkshire through the lives of prominent Christians. I found it fascinating to learn more about the people and places around us and discover how they've lived out their Christian lives. Today we're remembering social reformers, and Yorkshire has its fair share. Perhaps the best known is William Wilberforce, credited with leading the campaign to abolish the slave trade. Another, now much less well-known figure, was Richard Osler, from the Leeds-Bradford area, who led a campaign to reduce the working hours of children in factories. My third example is that of the father and son team, Joseph Roundtree and Benjamin Seabone Roundtree, who strive to improve the living and working conditions of people in York and beyond. Wilberforce has long been celebrated for his leadership in the campaign against the slave trade and then slavery itself in the British Empire. In recent years, people have rightly drawn attention to the many other people who worked on these campaigns including former slaves, Otavo and Cuguano, and Oladu Equiano, leading campaigners such as Hannah Moore and Thomas Clarkson, and a swathe of politicians, many of them won over by Wilberforce. Recognising that many people were involved in this campaign is a reminder that significant change in society is hard work, 
and acquires persistence and stamina, patience and determination. Wilberforce had these in abundance, stemming partly from his privileged upbringing in a wealthy merchant family in Hull, and partly from his adult Christian convictions. He was convinced that God had called him into Parliament to make a difference to the lives of others. With the support of other campaigners and Christian fellowship, he overcame setbacks and disappointments in the campaign against the slave trade and other campaigns he was involved in. And it's worth remembering that the opposition to this campaign came largely from the wealthy class in the country who benefited from slavery. Support came from a much wider group of people, most of whom did not vote for members of parliament at that time, which was most men and all women. One imaginative strand of their campaign was a boycott of sugar in 1791, on the grounds that selling or buying it made you complicit in slavery. Although this boycott petered out, it shows there was widespread support for the campaign against the slave trade and slavery. For at its height, 400,000 people were involved, at a time when many poor people could not even afford sugar. It took 15 years of presenting bills to Parliament almost annually, until the Act was passed abolishing the slave trade on British vessels in 1807. The campaign had depended on many people pushing in the same direction for decades. But I believe it's right to recognise the key contribution of William Wilberforce in making it happen. Without his willingness to stand against people of his own social class, to gradually win enough of them over, and his ability to harness the energy of many thousands of ordinary people, the campaign would have taken even longer. We can rightly celebrate this just as our former Archbishop Sentamu did in 2007 in a service at York Minster. My second show tool reformer is Richard Osler, who started work as a wholesaler, but then became a steward of a large rural estate north of Huddersfield. At some point in the 1820s, he became involved in the campaign to abolish slavery in the British Empire, which finally happened in 1833 days before Wilberforce died. Before that, Osler took up another cause, tackling the appalling conditions in the local mills. He was awakened to this cause in 1830 by a friend who told him what was happening in factories in Bradford, and he immediately wrote a letter to the Leeds Mercury newspaper about the state of slavery for little children in a Yorkshire town. Children between the ages of 7 and 14 were working daily from 6 in the morning to 7 in the evening, with just 30 minutes break all day. Connecting this with the hellish system of colonial slavery, as he called it, might not have been strictly accurate, but it got across something of the horrors of the factory system that had developed in industrial Britain. Being able to link these two campaigns is also another piece of evidence for the support of the working class in Britain for the abolition of slavery. If this had not been the case, Osler could not have used this example. When mill owners opposed any restriction on working time, he wrote an angry manifesto to the working classes of the West Riding and committees based on the pattern of Wesleyan class meetings were quickly set up to seek a 10 hour working day. Osler was a tall and imposing figure, with an uncomplicated view of the world, and he spoke passionately to large crowds, leading to his nickname as the Factory King. This was another campaign which took years to come to fulfilment, and Osler was not the one to see it through, because he became ill and lost energy. But his kicking off of the cause was crucial. His reputation was such that when he died in 1861, money was raised nationally for a statue, unveiled by Lord Shaftesbury in front of a crowd of over 100,000 people. It can still be seen in Northgate Square next to the Osler's shopping centre in Bradford. 
Finally, when talking about social reformers in the context of York, we cannot overlook the contribution of the Roundtree family. In particular, Joseph and Seabone not only developed a very successful business making chocolate and fruit gums, but also had a very personal involvement in caring for the poor in the slums of York. For example, every Sunday for decades, Joseph led Sunday school classes, which included helping adults to learn to read so they could better themselves. And realising the depth and extent of poverty, Joseph and Seabone went beyond helping individuals by seeking to change wider social conditions. In the 1890s and early 1900s, Joseph voluntarily introduced welfare benefits for the workers at his firm, including a female welfare office worker and then a boys welfare officer. He established sick and provident funds, a doctor's surgery, a savings scheme, a school for girls, a pension scheme, a school for boys and a sick benefits scheme. In due course, all these became government policy. In that same period, Seabone surveyed nearly 3,000 families living in slums in York. The careful survey work and analysis first led Joseph to create a model village at New Iswick for the working classes. And then he created a housing trust, which is still active in developing excellent housing in a number of towns across the north. Seabone's survey went on to influence national policy by informing the 1906 Liberal government in its own social reforms. And the work of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation continues to research and campaign against poverty in this country, providing detailed and respected reports. There is much more that could be said about all these reformers, but one final reflection is to notice that the main people I have highlighted are all white men. That does reflect the public history of Yorkshire, but it's good that we are now becoming more aware of the voices that have not always come down to the present day. It also happens that each of these men had very strong marriages and that their wives were very supportive of their, camp of their campaigning work. We have noted in the campaign against the slave trade important contributions from former African slaves, from a, number of, from a number of women and from a wider social class in the boycott of sugar. The Church of England, in its commemoration of social reformers, has begun to include women such as Josephine Butler, Florence Nightingale and today Henrietta Barnett, and it's now added the name of Alado Equiano to that of William Wilberforce. But I suspect that there are even more people we can learn from and be inspired by. Who do you know who can inspire another generation of social reformers? A prayer of protest written by Walter Brueggemann. Since our mothers and fathers cried out, since you heard their cries and noticed, since we left the brick production of Egypt, since you foiled the production schedules of Pharaoh, we have known your name, we have sensed your passion, we have treasured your vision of justice. And now we turn to you again, whose precious name we know. We turn to you because there are still impossible production schedules still exploitative systems, still cries of pain at injustice, still cheap labour that yields misery. We turn to you in impatience and exasperation, wondering how long. We bid you stir up those who can change things. Do your stirring in the jaded halls of government do your stirring in the cynical offices of the corporations. Do your stirring amid the voting public too anxious to care. Do your stirring in the church that thinks too much about purity and not enough about wages. Move as you moved in the ancient days. 
move the waters and the flocks and the herds towards new status, new statutes and regulations, new equity and good health care, new dignity that cannot be given on the cheap. We have known now long since that you reject cheap grace, even as we now know that you reject cheap labour. You, God of justice and dignity and equity, keep the promises you bodied in Jesus, that the poor may be first-class members of society, that the needy may have good care and respect, that the poor earth may rejoice in well-being, that we may all come to Sabbath rest together, the owner and the worker, the leisure class and the labour class, all at peace in dignity and justice, not on the cheap, but good measure, pressed down, running over, forgiven. Amen.